Welcome, I'm Nikki Young, Program Manager with the Child Neurology Foundation. Today's talk is part of our ongoing series, bringing together caregivers and health professionals to provide expert advice to the child neurology community. Each topic focuses on what we heard from our parent partners and our families as a top priority. Today, we are discussing gene therapy, what to ex expect and when to consider it for your child. First, I'd like to thank our 2021 sponsors. We couldn't do this without your support. To get us started today, we'll first hear from Dr. Amy Waldman, Associate Director of Neurology Gene Therapy and Medical Director of the Leukodystrophy Center Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She'll give us a broad introduction to gene therapy and address some of the most common questions and misconceptions. Then we'll hear from Dr. Jan John Bransima, Attending Physician and Neuromuscular Education Director and Neuromuscular Section Head at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, your child. Dr. Bransima will share his insights and firsthand experience with gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. Finally, we hear from a family on their experience with gene therapy. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Waldman. Thank, welcome and thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Nikki. I am delighted to be here. Hello to the Child Neurology Foundation. I am delighted to partner with everyone on these educational series for ourselves, our patients, providers, and the neurology community. So I'm gonna actually give a little intro on gene therapy. I wanna start by saying that we are talking today about mostly uh, an introduction to gene therapy, but when to consider gene therapy after it has already been approved by the FDA. In general, uh, gene therapy is available to our patients in clinical trials, but we're not really discussing the decision to participate in a clinical trial today. That is a, a different actually consideration. So most of what we're talking about today is thinking about the opportunities for gene therapy after they've been approved um, in the, by the FDA. So after speaking a little bit about what is gene therapy, we're going to talk about its delivery and then how things that you can consider in terms of participating in a gene therapy program. So I'm gonna start with what is gene therapy. So very simply, gene therapy is the transfer of genetic material to a patient in order to treat a disease. And this can be done in multiple different ways. So on the top of your screen, you'll see gene augmentation. And here a functional gene is inserted into a genetic code where the gene is, is broken or not working properly. So you're giving the patient the working copy of the gene, and then you correct the cell in that way. The bottom shown in B is the ability to suppress a gene. So there are some genes that are turned on or overactive and making a protein or other component that is causing toxicity to the cell. And so here you're giving an inhibitory gene to turn off the gene that is not working properly. There's also a gene editing technique that I'm not showing, um, but we're not going to talk as much about that type of um, gene therapy today. And as we think about these gene therapies, we can think about the diseases they treat. Those are often uh, quite different. Um, we can think about the vector, the type of machinery that is harboring the, the gene therapy product. Um, or we can think about in vivo, direct delivery of gene therapy or ex vivo gene therapy, um, delivery that is modified, a gene, gene product that modif is modified outside of the body and given back to the patient. And I'm gonna speak a little bit today about understanding the difference between in vivo and ex vivo gene therapy. And there's some differences to consider. But what's so challenging in neurology is making sure that that gene therapy product gets to the desired tissue. I'm gonna start with in vivo and ex vivo gene therapy and just ex uh, explain, the, explain the difference to begin. So in vivo gene therapy is where you are directly delivering a product to the patient. So for example, what's shown here is that this patient is getting an, an intravenous, a delivery of the gene therapy right into the body or into the brain itself. So these are direct delivery. And we're gonna explore these a little bit more in the next slide. Whereas ex vivo gene therapy is occurring outside of the body. So in this scheme, the hematopoietic stem cells, so blood stem cells from a patient, are taken from that individual, 
these stem cells are modified outside of the body or in a, in a special lab. And then these modified cells are given back to the body. So this is in vivo versus ex vivo gene therapy. And we'll spend the next couple of slides talking about this. So this is a little bit difficult to see, but when we're trying to get access to different parts of the brain, we can directly deliver gene therapy to the eye shown here, to the ear, the cochlea of the ear, to the muscle where you direct inject directly into those muscles, into the lungs by the nose. So you inhale the gene therapy or into the brain where you directly inject into the brain. We'll talk about how we do that in the next slide. But most of our brain and spinal cord um, uh, gene therapy trials and, and programs are going to happen through these other mechanisms, which are a little bit more indirect into the brain and spinal cord. So to show you a little bit more about the in vivo gene therapy delivery system, so we have intraparenchymal delivery where we're gonna directly inject into brain tissue. And to get access to the brain, we all rely on our neurosurgeons to drill holes in parts of the scalp so that they can actually put a needle in and directly inject the brain tissue. And then what can be challenging in neurologic disease is the spread of that gene therapy beyond the insertional point. So beyond the point of where the neurosurgeon has inserted the, the, the vector. It's a little bit easier to direct into the cerebral spinal fluid. So there's fluid that surrounds the brain and spinal cord. And you can deliver this again through a burr hole right into the center of the brain, which is where that pool of spinal fluid is housed. So you direct it into the fluid and then the fluid permeates throughout the brain. You can also try intracisternal magna, so into the space just beneath where the brain is ending in the back of the, or is uh, laying in the back of the head or into the lower part of the spinal cord into the intrathecal space through a spinal tap. So those are indirect deliveries where you're using the fluid system surrounding the brain to, to um, inject or to deliver, excuse me, the gene therapy. But also an indirect gene therapy is actually into the venous system itself. So you direct into the veins, but then you actually need the, the venous system and, and the blood system to access the brain and the brain tissues. Now, this is an old schema, but I, I put it up here just as a reminder that things that go into the blood can't necessarily get into the brain tissue. This is the, the theory behind ex vivo gene therapy. So sometimes when you inject into the blood system, um, that product can't cross into the brain. So what, what we're showing here, these are the normal cells that that float through our blood, that, that pass through the blood system. Um, and if you inject a protein, for example, a protein is not gonna cross from the blood system into the brain tissue itself. But these blood cells, obviously there's a lot of blood in the brain, these blood cells can actually cross the blood brain barrier and then get into the brain tissue. So the idea behind doing a hematopoietic stem cell or traditionally a bone marrow transplant is that you're using the body's own ability to get access into the brain by using the blood system or the, the, the venous system. So the challenge though, is we used to think that when you do a stem cell transplant, that the cells then can correct the the deficiency in the surrounding cells. We have learned that this is not quite the correct mechanism, so I won't spend too much time on that, that the mechanism behind stem cell transplant for some neurologic disease is to improve myelination. But that's, oh, that's probably a topic for another day. I simply show this to say, you need to think about how you're gonna get access. And so one of the ways that we use ex vivo gene therapy and neurology is to use the blood system, so to use our own blood cells genetically modify them, give them back to the patient, and then those get access into the brain. So that's the background behind ex vivo gene therapy. So going back to our in vivo versus ex vivo gene therapy, I wanted to provide just some examples, there are more and growing every day, about different viral vectors that we use for each of these. So in in vivo gene therapy, 
Most commonly these days, we're using adeno-associated viral vectors, although there are some others. And for ex vivo gene therapy, right now we've used lentiviral vectors. So two different vector types, depending on if it's in vivo versus ex vivo. And as you can see, the lentiviral vector list is a little bit shorter here. Um, most of the neurology trials these days are using adeno-associated viral vectors because those are in vivo gene therapy products that can get access uh, to the, the brain through either the direct injection or through those spinal mechanisms or IV that I, those are those um, fluid mechanisms, the cerebral spinal fluid mechanisms or IV as shown here. So now that you have a little bit of background in terms of the differences and in terms of in vivo versus ex vivo, the different vectors, I wanted to talk just very briefly about the safety of gene therapy. So a few things that we think about when we think about the safety of gene therapy include insertional mutagenesis and genotoxicity. So you are altering the genetic code. Is that gonna cause some sort of uh, deleter deleterious effect to that gene or to the body. And a lot of what we learn about in, insatiable mutagenesis and genotoxicity um, happens in the preclinical work and the, the, the clinical trial phases, um, but certainly can happen in the, in the post-marketing or the approved therapies as well. So something uh, for us to be aware of. What I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about today is immunotoxicity. Um, so when we give a... Um, a foreign product, a gene therapy is a foreign product or manufactured by a lab, there's always the potential for the body to react to it. And so I'm gonna show you some things that we think about uh, in the next slide. And then I also wanna comment just very briefly about vector shedding. We think about horizontal and vertical transmission, meaning is the person who receives the gene therapy going to um, spread that or, or pass along those changes in the gene therapy to their offspring or to, for example, a partner. I wanna to speak to you a little bit more about just some general principles about the safety of gene therapy. When we think about our in vivo gene therapy programs using adeno-associated viruses, that mimics viruses that our bodies have previously seen and there's the potential for the body to react to this actual gene therapy product because of this, um, this viral vector. So often we will administer steroids to decrease the immune response so the body does not attack, attack the gene therapy product. And then we have to think about some toxicities that we see. So there are certain individuals that have a difference about their liver and their liver function that make them more susceptible to turnover with these products. Um, and they can actually become toxic or cause a cancer in the liver. Um, and scientists are trying to understudy this, are, are trying to study this effect. And it seems that there are certain individuals that are more susceptible, although we're still at a uh, very early stage and we don't test everyone for these differences to their liver. So for now, we're still broadly watching the liver of many patients who receive in vivo gene therapy. There also can be rare side effects that affect the blood and kidney. So we are monitoring patients' um, blood counts in terms of their kidney function and their um, hematopoietic function to make sure that we don't see any toxicities related there. And then the last I will, thing I will mention is some of the sensory neurons lie very close to the cerebrospinal fluid. So there's a concern that when you're giving the direct inject injections into the spinal fluid, that some of those sensory neurons may be a little bit more susceptible to, to toxicity. And this is also being studied more extensively in animal models um, at the moment. But these are the toxicities that we are mainly thinking about in in vivo gene therapy. For our ex vivo gene therapy, remember these are done in combination with the hematopoietic stem cell or bone marrow transplant. And those patients require um, a myeloablative conditioning, which is getting rid of their current immune system. So you have to give chemotherapy to get rid of the current immune system in order to make room for the new immune system and the new immune cells that are, are given to the patient through a transplant. So there are transplant related complications. Luckily you're using the patient's own cells. So hopefully um, that's a little bit more tolerated but the conditioning can still have some effects. 
So when you're considering a gene therapy, you, we always have to think about the risk benefit ratio. Um, and certainly in our patient population, when we're thinking about all these neurologic diseases, quite honestly, the last thing that we're thinking about is a blood test or the liver. Um, so usually the risk benefit ratio um, is in favor of trying to help some of these really devastating neurologic disorders. Um, but it's important to understand the disease mechanism and biology and how the gene therapy will get access to the regions that are affected in the brain. You have to think about the vector and delivery. So how is this going to be administered? Is it um, the, one of the IV gene therapies? Is it one of the gene therapies that has to be directly injected into the brain or into the fluid? Um, and then maybe asking some questions about what, what is known about the animal and human toxicities. So making sure you're truly informed about what is happening in that gene therapy space. And post-gene therapy, I really recommend that people have a partnership in care. Um, as neurologists, we are so focused, of course, on the brain, but we need to think about your body or your, your child's body as a whole. So we like to educate our patients. Um, I tell people to create a care and treatment team. So your neurologist is probably going to be your lead, but you might want to consider um, updating your primary care uh, provider or about labs that need to be followed or, or the liver that needs to be followed. So they're aware um, of things to look for as well. And then you devise a long-term monitoring plan in combination with the neurologist, with say your pediatrician, um, where you say, how often are you going to check the liver? How is that? What is that going to look like? How often are you going to check the blood or the kidney? Who's going to check the, ner the nervous system, which is probably mostly going to be your neurologist, but really monitoring, do you need these things annually? Do you need them less frequent than that? Um, but coming up with a care plan and then following it over time. So that's the end of my uh, introduction to gene therapy, and I am delighted to introduce a colleague from Children's Hospital Philadelphia, Dr. John Branzema, who's going to speak to us about the experience of gene transfer in spinal muscular atrophy. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you to the Child Neurology Society or, or Child Neurology Foundation for the opportunity to contribute today. Um, I am very pleased to be able to share some practical advice and experience based on having a gene transfer therapy available for one of our neuromuscular diseases in the clinic now for a couple of years, and specifically for spinal muscular atrophy or SMA. Mm -hmm. These are my disclosures. We're going to talk about SMA briefly today and then talk about why we would use gene transfer for this disease. Uh, but I wanted to focus most of the time on some tips for families who are considering gene therapy as that's our main objective today. SMA, just to introduce it to you briefly, is the leading genetic cause of infant death. It's an autosomal recessive disease, meaning that usually parents are unaffected and it's a combination of the mother and father that genetics that leads to disease in the child. It has an incidence of about one in 10,000 live births and the carrier rate is even higher, about one in 50 people, depending on the population you study. Um, the disease is caused by degeneration of what are called motor neurons, which are um, living in the spinal cord and the brainstem. And uh, the types were defined based on a natural history of not achieving a certain milestone. So we'll go over this in the next slide, but you can see pictures of the most severe form affecting babies in type one, up to the mildest form type three and four, where people will walk with the disease. Um, so here again, you can see the different types. And unfortunately, the most common is the um, two thirds of patients who will present as infants before six months of age. Their life expectancy is less than two years without fully supporting breathing and um, uh, nutrition. Um, the type two is about a third of the patients. These patients sit but never walk independently. And then type three are patients who have walked at some point in their life but may um, eventually lose that ability because in every form of SMA, after the time of diagnosis, you eventually reach a time where there's relentless decline in your function because of loss of these motor neurons. So to understand the genetics behind this disease, uh, I have to 
very briefly go over this to understand the treatments. Uh, people with SMA are all missing their SMN1 or survival motor neuron 1 gene. Uh, both copies are usually deleted, although in some patients, less than 5% of them, it will be a mutation that's specific within the gene or some sort of inversion or something that's making the gene not work. Um, but um, the end of the day for somebody with SMA is that both copies of SMN don't work. They do have another gene on the same chromosome, chromosome 5, called SMN2. Um, and SMN2 is very similar to SMN1, but it doesn't make the SMN protein as well as SMN1 does. And the reason for that is this one spelling change in the difference here on the left and the right. You can see there is a C on the left and a T on the right in what's called exon 7 in the gene. Um, and in SMN2, when you have that change, it causes what's made to the majority of the time not be usable by the body. Only about 10 to 15 percent of the what we call transcripts or the way that the gene is actually um, made into a message, which then gets made into a protein only about 10 or 15% of that protein is actually usable by the body because most of it doesn't include that exon 7 in the message. And this tends in every patient to lead to weakness of the arms and legs. And um, the more severe forms when it involves the brainstem also causes trouble with swallowing and trouble with breathing. Eventually patients also have um, gastrointestinal dysfunction with trouble with movement of things through the GI system. And in the severe forms, we tend to see some heart involvement as well. To be able to care for this disease effectively takes a huge team of people. Um, the neurologist is often at the core with the family and patient and caregiver, um, but we also have pulmonologists, orthopedics, um, rehab specialists from physical and occupational therapy, um, and sometimes speech therapy, nutrition support, endocrine health with bone health, um, and psychosocial considerations as well. Um, so it really is a team effort to make sure that somebody living with SMA has the best possible experience of the disease. So why would we use gene transfer here? Well, um, the gene transfer approach um, that was approved for this disease is called onisemnogene apoparvivec. Um, and it's a very good disease to target this way because there's a simple genetic change. They're missing their SMN1 gene on both copies. It can be easily put into one of those viral vectors that Dr. Waldman was speaking about. Um, and the way that this particular gene transfer works is it's in an AAV or adeno-associated virus called AAV9. Um, and it's delivered through an intravenous um, to the uh, person just one time. It doesn't go into the person's own DNA. The transgene or the SMN gene that's inside the vector lives on the, in the nucleus of the cells that it gets into on its own and makes its own SMN protein using the cell's machinery. And so the hope is that we transduce, which is the term for getting the transgene into the tissue, um, transduce the motor neurons at a high level because the motor neurons are the ones that are really unhealthy in this disease. Uh, but there's a need for um, SMN protein in all tissues of the body. And so there's a hope that some of the other tissues will also get corrected this way, although we don't want to overcorrect it in tissues that aren't needing SMN as much. What we saw in the research trials with this was very striking in terms of the impact on the disease. So these were all infants with the most common form where they would have presented before six months of life with symptoms and have a life expectancy of less than two years unless um, fully supported with their breathing and nutrition. And in this New England Journal of Medicine publication, you can see that the survival of the patients in both the low and the high dose cohort went beyond that mark where we would have expected them to need the support without needing those kind of supports. They were able um, to get through their day without needing a large amount of respiratory support, and all patients survived in this cohort um, initially up to that point. 
The motor function scales that were measured for the patients also improved significantly. So this is something called the CHOP and TEN score, which is a way to measure the motor function in babies. And you can see that after being treated in the low dose cohort, there was an improvement, but it was somewhat modest. Whereas when we gave the higher dose um, in the trials, it really significantly improved the score to the point where it was near normal in many patients. A normal score would be 64 on this scale. What do we have to think about in terms of toxicities with this approach? Well, initially after giving the virus, um, there's an initial syndrome that can happen just like any virus affecting a person. You may feel kind of crummy, have a fever, maybe have some vomiting um, and some lethargy. Um, in babies especially, this is really concerning if it happens because you want to make sure that their nutrition is appropriate and that they're getting the amount of um, uh, things that they need for their health um, during this period. And sometimes we would need to hospitalize some of the patients if they had a fever due to their young age. Um, liver inflammation is another very common toxicity. As Dr. Waldman mentioned, the liver is kind of the clearinghouse for the body and is a place where things go to once you deliver them to the blood. Um, so we see this increase in some of the liver-related testing, something called a transaminase or an AST, ALT. These are things that are monitored um, closely in the period following given, uh, being given the gene treatment. Um, and it's known that giving steroids with the therapy makes this less likely to happen. If you're seeing an increase in liver toxicity, you can also increase the dose of steroid and most patients will settle down once they get a little bit more steroid for a period of time and eventually be able to taper down. Um, but if this reaction is severe and longstanding, um, it can take a long course of steroids before they're able to um, wean down. That's unusual, but it does happen. Also, platelets can go down after, that's called thrombocytopenia, that's a part of the blood that's important for clotting. Um, and after the research trials were completed, there was no concern for any specific complement-driven reaction that happened that was seen. But when we brought it into the commercial setting, a few babies have been reported around the world that had something called um, microcytic angiopathy, or another term for that is hemolytic uremic syndrome. Um, this is an uh, immune type reaction that causes small clots to form in blood vessels, and the kidney especially is very um, susceptible if that occurs, but also the liver and other tissues. If you see this reaction, there needs to be a significant increase in the amount of immune suppression that the person is given, um, and they may also need things like dialysis for a period of time. So thankfully, this is extremely rare with this particular gene transfer approach, but complement in general is something that people are watching very closely in research trials with gene therapy to ensure that they understand the risk for it and how to effectively respond if it's occurring. Um, there were also animal model concerns for impact on the heart, um, what's called myocardial necrosis, but we've been following that very closely post-treatment and have intended to run into issues in the clinic related to heart toxicity. And then as Dr. Waldman mentioned, those sensory neurons are the neurons that live in the dorsal root ganglion. And, and there was a concern also whether these um, AAV9 especially risk, uh, uh, associated um, treatments may affect these sensory nerves, but we haven't seen any clinical evidence for that in any of the follow-up that we've had so far in the clinic with these patients. Um, so this treatment was approved by the FDA in May of 2019, based on all of these research trials here that I've listed in different populations. Some were infants, some were older um, patients that were sitters with SMA. Um, and then there's also um, a pre-symptomatic trial looking at patients who haven't yet developed symptoms of their SMA and how they're doing. So let's talk about some tips. Um, in general, when we're thinking about gene therapy, you want to be asking, as Dr. Waldman mentioned, about what's known in animals and people about it. Um, the 
uh, experience is still relatively new with the clinical. As I mentioned, it's just been around since 2019, but with the research trials, we have up to um, six or seven years of follow-up data with the first uh, treated patients with this approach. Um, as you can see in the table there with the animal models, there's been quite a long follow-up for some of the gene therapy approaches, up to 15 years in some of the monkey models, for example. Um, and so this is encouraging that there may be a durable effect um, in terms of it still having an effect many years after treatment, even in tissues that are high turnover in terms of the cell types. Um, we also want to be conscious about the safety relative to how large the person is that you're dosing, how much vector are you needing to give them by what method, and is that more or less toxic for the person in terms of potential side effects. Um, there are issues around manufacturing the vector and the transgene and, and making sure that the dose is um, pure and is what you're intending to give and actually gets to the tissues that you want it to. Um, if you have antibodies to the type of vector that is being used currently, you can't be dosed with gene therapy. So if you're measured to have AAV9 antibodies just from having been exposed to that previously in your life, we can't give the gene transfer treatment for SMA to those people, unfortunately. Sometimes if it's a baby, it may be that it's from mom through placental transfer. And if we follow that over time, it eventually will come down low enough. But if it's an older patient, it's usually their own immune system that is making those antibodies bodies. And until there's a, a protocol developed for how to safely dose in that context, we can't do it currently. Um, the long-term safety is still being sorted out. And we talked about some of the things to watch for, like long-term liver toxicity, for example. This is still being studied. And is there a potential for things getting into the host's DNA? And how does that affect future generations um, is also an open question that still needs further study. Um, and one of the key questions is, do all of the tissues that need whatever you're replacing get it effectively? And if so, how long does it last for? Motor neurons are an advantage because you have your population of motor neurons for life when you're born, um, and they never divide or change. And so if we can get this gene therapy into the motor neurons early in life, the hope is that it will stay with the person for their life and um, give a, a stability to those motor neurons so that they can keep the person strong and healthy. Um, but we don't know for sure the long-term durability until there's enough time that passes with the people that have been um, dosed to ensure that that's the case. So some practical tips when you're going through this process with your family, you want to try to avoid any additional stressors uh, right before, during, and after the therapy. So be very careful about interacting with other people, especially if they're sick. Um, this is something that you can talk with your provider about how stringent to be depending on the approach. Um, but we are um, very careful to try to avoid any additional challenges around the time of gene transfer. As I mentioned also, if you have antibodies to the vector, unfortunately you can't be dosed. Um, we wanna be careful around vaccinations. These young babies especially need a lot of vaccines during that time, and we wanna be careful with the timing of that relative to the treatment. If you're breastfeeding your infant, it's okay to breastfeed while you're giving gene therapy, at least in the context of the SMA related. There may change depending on the type of gene therapy. So it's important to ask your provider about whether breastfeeding would at all be a concern related to antibodies from mom getting to the baby while they're being treated. And then shedding of the virus itself afterwards, at least in the context of this treatment, we know that it stays um, in uh, uh, breathing tissue, uh, stuff that the, the, the person is breathing out. Um, and, um, uh, urine for a very short period of time, um, but that stool lasts a little bit longer. And so the general recommendation is for at least a month, um, but conservatively for two months, um, you should use gloves while uh, handling any dirty diapers um, and double bag them before throwing them in the garbage to protect both other household family members from potentially getting exposed to what's being shedded in terms of the virus and also the general community. Um, also don't bathe 
bathe with siblings, especially if they are also potentially affected with the disease, because we want them to stay um, antibody negative so that they also can be treated. Um, and really important with any gene therapy uh, treatment is to maintain the optimal standard of care for the disease all through before receiving treatment and afterwards. Um, so I always tell my patients, we don't have a cure for this disease yet. This is a treatment, um, but you still have SMA and we really need to see you long-term to ensure that we are monitoring appropriately for both what the disease can do to you, even though you've been treated, and also for any potential side effects effects from the treatment. Um, so we know now um, that especially after all of this research experience that early treatment is really important. When we talk about stroke, we say time is brain. Now we're talking in the SMA world as time is motor neuron. Uh, and we really want to intervene as soon as possible. And this is why it's very encouraging um, that SMA is now being screened for both prenatally in a lot of families that are considering pregnancy by testing mom and dad for whether they're carriers, but also newborn babies are being screened across the country. And we're now up to almost 90% of babies born in the United States um, being screened for SMA as newborns. Now, it's important to remember that because of that 5% group that has a difference other than a deletion that's causing their SMN1 gene um, not to work, that they'll be missed by both the carrier screening and the newborn screening and still present with symptoms. So we still need to recognize symptoms of this disease and get people tested as soon as possible if they're having concerning symptoms for SMA, um, but we're catching most of these patients before they have symptoms, hopefully, so that we can treat them as soon as possible. You can see the worldwide experience in different countries also from a recent article here. And so the other advantage I just wanted to mention briefly in SMA that we have is that besides the gene transfer treatment, we have two very effective treatments that work mostly on the SMN2 gene, the RNA that's produced by that. One is called nusinersen, which needs spinal fluid delivery through a lumbar puncture. And then there's Rizdaplam, which is a small molecule that actually is taken um, orally each day through a suspension in patients. Um, and both of these are known to increase the amount of SMN protein also. So we do have other options if people can't be treated by the gene transfer therapy, or if the family prefers these other options after talking through all of them comprehensively. And this isn't going to be the case for every disease, but I think as we have more and more options coming into research trials, it does become more and more complicated in terms of navigating this together um, as we're trying to make the best suggestions for families um, to decide what they want to do for their child. And so we need to think about the timing of when we do this. Can we use any of these in combination in certain people who might benefit from more than one approach? And are there other treatments besides the genetically targeted ones that we need to use for the disease or the symptoms also um, that we can use in combination with treatment? So now we've gone from a world where everybody was losing function after they had their diagnosis of SMA to a world where um, motor neurons are being stabilized and people are able to make gains. Um, we have um, newborn and prenatal screening in place in many places. Um, and we're starting to think of people with SMA not in terms of the type 1, type 2, type 3 that I talked about, but in terms of walkers, sitters, and non-sitters. Um, the exciting thing is that now people can actually improve prove in terms of their category, whereas most times we didn't see people go past the point where they were diagnosed in terms of their motor development. And so the normal development of a child is now allowed to happen superimposed on these stabilized motor neurons. And somebody who initially was only able to sit may eventually start to walk um, because they're able to do so with their development despite having developed symptoms when they were sitting. Um, there's also a lot more to be learned about what happens with these therapies when they're delivered to people who are further along in their experience of their um, disease. And we have some good real world experience now with the two other medications that I mentioned, nusinersen and Ristaplam in this context. Also gene transfer is being studied given more directly to the spinal fluid through um, a lumbar puncture or spinal tap injection for some older patients also um, to see whether that's an effective approach when you're a larger person and it may be safer to do that way than giving it through a systemic intravenous to the blood delivery.
So again, the multi-system, uh, multi-systemic approach, multidisciplinary care team is very important in this disease. And we need to remember that once you have SMA, you need to be established with one of these care teams for your life and ensure that um, you're getting the best possible outcome from your disease by careful attention to optimizing function and um, quality of life with this disease. A very quick mention that we don't think that we're done with this disease by any stretch. There's still a very active um, research pipeline, and this is from CureSMA, which is a wonderful advocacy organization in the space um, that um, uh, helps to facilitate um, the community's approach to ensuring that we're doing absolutely everything that we can for this disease. So in conclusion, um, it's really a new era in SMA care because of these treatments coming into the clinic. Gene transfer transforms lives for some people living with SMA, and we see that every time we hold a clinic where an SMA patient comes, that we're in a new world now in terms of the experience of the disease, um, but that we still need to have lifelong follow-up um, for everybody living with SMA. And I'll end with some pictures of the dogs that my partner and I breed together. These are Lakeland Terrier puppies and older dogs. Um, if you have any questions about what we talked about here in the presentation, there's an email there for the Child Neurology Foundation. And I'm sure that Dr. Waldman and also myself would be more than happy um, to respond to any questions that come through about what we've talked about today. I hope it was helpful for you. And to finish, we're actually going to have a short video um, where I talk to one of the families um, who went through the experience of receiving uh, gene transfer for their um, child living with SMA and what that was like for them. Oh, I'm very excited yeah. to be joined in this no, next part of the presentation by Sabrina Bazemore and her daughter Zoe, who I've known in the clinic for just over two years now. Um, Zoe is now two. I can't believe how quickly the time flies, but we are so pleased that you're willing to share your story with us. It's fine. Thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this. Um, so I had first met you um, at a few months of life with Zoe, and you had had the conversation about her having SMA um, in a different center. Can you tell me a little bit about what that was like, getting the call about the newborn screening diagnosis of SMA and having that first conversation? That was very hard. It really was. It was a hard hit. Uh, I didn't really know how to take it other than uh, when I told her father, they called us in the office early. <laughs> when they called us in the office early, I told him I said something's not right. I said they're not going to call you in before time because most of the time, if nothing's wrong, you'll go ahead and go to the next visit. And then after that, if they call me in early, something's wrong. So when I went to the doctor's office, I was upset because I knew something was wrong. Uh, and the lady told us the way she described it. I thought it was a little rude, but she called it floppy baby syndrome. And I didn't know what that meant. I was lost. I, I really didn't know how to respond to it. I just got really upset. And then after she told me, don't look it up. I wouldn't look it up anyway. <laughs> and what I looked up was heartbreaking. When I read up on it, and she was at that point, she was probably like a month and a half. I just really studied, studied hard what SMA meant, how it, how it worked, and how I played a role and her father played a role. Um, it still hurt. It hurt until she was about four or five months and I came up here at that point for about four five months after she was born and then I came to ch uh, chop but yes it hurt it hurt really really bad mm -hmm. I didn't know how to function I felt alone and even trying to explain it to my family it seemed like nobody understood everybody wanted to place blame and I tried to explain to them after I researched that it's nobody's fault it's just that that's the way it was. And it actually took me all the way up to three months before I was willing to accept it, that that was just Zoe, that was part of Zoe, and that's who Zoe's going to be. I think one thing I've heard from some other families I've worked with also is that it's tough when your baby seems so normal, right? You have a normal baby, and um, somebody's telling you that they have a genetic problem that's going to 
change eventually over time. But you can't oh. do anything wrong with your baby in the moment, right? Yes. Um, oh. One thing I've learned with you over the years is that you're a wonderful advocate for Zoe, and I'm not surprised that you did a lot of research on your own because you always have really great <laughs> yes. questions in the clinic. Yeah. But just to clarify for the folks listening, um, I think something unique about Zoe's situation is that she does have a higher copy number of SMN2 copies, yeah. which we've talked about previously yeah. in the as being related yeah. to how severe the SMA is. And so in some people's um, decision-making in this situation, they will decide to wait um, and follow very closely all sorts of different things clinically um, and then treat at some point if they see something changing. Um, so I remember having a couple of very long conversations with you when I first met you because Zoe was not on any treatment when I first met you. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what it was about our conversations that we had that really got you to the point of wanting to succeed with the replacement treatment. Like what kind of thoughts were on your mind at that point? Well, what it was more so than anything, I had researched so much and the only option that I seen other than Spinraza. And I just didn't want to sign Zoe up for the rest of her life to kind of be able to depend on that. To like, okay, well, mom, we got to go this month to go get my shot. Mom, we got to go this month to go get my shot. And it will just go on for the rest of her life. And I just didn't want to sign her up. And I know you suggested it as well. <laughs> you suggested it as well. And I just told you, no, I can't. I No, that's just not an option. And I just refused to do it because I did not want to wait, being as though I know SMA is a thing where it's uh, degenerative. And once it goes, it's gone. So I know by Zoe having a higher, you know, <laughs> amount of SMN genes, I know that was going to work out in her best interest. And my thing is, what am I waiting for? Am I going to wait for her to lose muscle and just get weak and weak over the years and then say, hey, you know what? I'll take that option. I'll just go ahead and I'll do something now. And at that point, she has lost those muscles that she can keep. And I just want to put her in a position where she can have a better quality of life. Because I'm not going to be around that time. <laughs> and if she can have something that's going to help her, that's going to benefit her, for her to be able to interact with other children, like she might want to as she get older, and for me to sit there and just not do nothing is just not going to, I just wouldn't want to tolerate it. That's just not what I was going to do. So, um, what kind of expectations did you have from being treated with the gene transfer therapy? Were there things that you were hopeful about? Were there things you were worried about before she got the infusion? Yes, and I can say no. And I can say no because at that time, once I found out she had SMA, there were so many limits on what kind of treatment that was available for children with SMA. So I know, I, like I said, I knew about Spiraza. And then when I read up on the gene therapy, I was like, oh, that's good. Is they'll be able to replace that gene that she's missing. Now I went on their site, read up on it. I read it so I couldn't read no more. I went on there and saw kids that had different types of SMA and how it worked for them. And I figured, you know, like I said, I don't want to wait for Zoe to start kind of like sad to say falling apart Mama. before I do something. Mama. And I just don't think Mama. that would have been right for her. Not for me. Not because if it was me, I'm not gonna lie. I probably would have done it. <laughs> if it was for me, I would have done it. But I could not be selfish to not give her that opportunity where she could interact and do the other things that children can do. And how could I explain to her when she get older? She'd be like, mommy, that drug costs a lot. But imagine if we could have got it. Mm. What am I going to say to her? Yeah. Oh, mommy didn't think it was a good thing for me. And she's going to be like, okay, well, mom, I can't walk long enough before I get tired. Those are just things I didn't want to take on. I couldn't take on that responsibility. And she knows when she get older that her mom did not try to provide the best thing for her so that she had a better quality. Um, do you um, 
uh, connect much with other families in, in social media or other forums? Did you talk with anybody else who had been through the experience of gene therapy? And if so, what I've was helpful tried, to you I've doing? tried and I still try now. And I think I found one lady, just one. <laughs> it's called my SMA. I found one lady who said that her daughter had gotten it and she was type two and she's going great with it. I found one, just one. And it's just, you know, over time, it's kind of sad that all parents aren't able to get it because I think it's a little unreasonable for somebody to be put in a position where, hey, my child can't get that treatment and that's just gonna eat away at you. And by that eating away at you, I just wouldn't be able, like I said, mentally, I wouldn't be able to deal with the fact that I didn't take that step to go out of my way so that she can have sex. Mm -hmm. And um, what was most helpful to you about what you heard from our provider team about the experience? Were there things that really prepared you for the dose or were there things you wish you had heard ahead of time that you don't remember hearing that came up later and you regret not hearing? Y'all told me everything. I think y'all did an excellent job. I think you did an excellent job. I think everyone did an excellent job. And even when she got the treatment, they was cheering for her, but you know, with COVID going on, they said they couldn't clap and applause and everything. And I was scared. And for some reason, she woke up and she looked at me and she smiled and she went back to sleep. Mm -hmm. So that made me feel good because I was like, okay, she's okay. She, she's still functioning the way she needs to be functioning. And actually, and I've read it, that some parents can tell the difference for the man. I've seen a slight difference in the way that she was moving and doing all of this stuff. And I'm like, okay, okay, I'm still scared, but okay. <laughs> the hardest part was the medicine for her liver. And that was vicious. I had to, you know, I'm here by myself. Her father's not here. He's in Georgia. Um, mentally, it took a lot because she was throwing up wasn't like really bad, bad, but it became a thing where she actually couldn't take the steroids. She couldn't do it. And we got through it. You gave some suggestions. Everybody gave some suggestions. So it worked. I didn't think it was gonna get through it. Sometimes she was throwing up, I would cry and you know, go go. She's looking at me like, why are you crying, mom? I, I just it was hurting for me to see her go, even though it was just some throwing up. It, it just hurt me to even see that, so. I remember how tough that was, but we did figure it out together. It took some time, but we, we tried a lot of different things, but we got there. Um, what, what kind of advice would you give to other families that are thinking of gene therapy? What kind of messages would you want them to hear um, based on your experience? I would say, you know, think about your child first. I know that, you know, you might be a little concerned, but you know, this is the way that I feel from the research that I've done. All you know is for right now, you, you know, you have at least five years. You know for a fact, five years you solid have to see your baby, do what she needs to do, see how she's going to progress. And even after the five years or six years or whatever point that it, it just doesn't work out, the way that you think it should, you know now they have different ways that they have for treatment. So it's not like Zilgensma and Spinraza. I do not know the one, the name of one of them. <laughs> There's Is been one more approved. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's called um, RISD or RISDAPLAM. That would be the third option yes. now, but we're always trying to learn more and, and get new options in the clinic. So it's been such an exciting time for sure. Yes. So I said, okay, well, we have a pill. pill she can take one pill. So I just think of it as a positive thing. I just think of it as right now she can be a child. And if it's, like I said, whatever point where it just might not be working the way that we want to work, I know that gives us a time where they can come up with many, many more things. So whether you, you know, paranoid or just, just think it might not be the, the right thing. Go on, meet up on your intimate, and just realize you have five solid years that we know factually it has worked for children. So if the child has type E, 
type one, type two, type three. I really don't even care. Type four, all <laughs> everybody should be able to get that treatment and just watch their child develop and see the things that they do. But just don't be paranoid. That's all. Um, Zoe has done a wonderful job throughout the video of showing us just how normal she is as a two-year-old. She's got a strong voice and strong opinions and shares it with the world. And it's just wonderful to see her thriving so much in the clinic. Um, so I want to thank both you and Zoe again for being with us today. And I think we're going to finish our segment with just a short video of Zoe being a, a cute two-year-old and um, uh, uh, just celebrating that we've been able to impact her life so much with this treatment. Yes. Thanks again yeah. so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you very much for your attention and all the best. Thank you, Dr. Brainsma and Dr. Waldman. I appreciate your time today. I did have a, just a couple quick questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, Dr. Waldman, I think this is for you. Would you, uh, when could a family that is maybe considering gene therapy anticipate results or what, what sort of expectations should they have? Yeah, that's a great question. So it, it first depends on the disease and the disease mechanism. So as you heard, for example, SMA has different phenotypes, meaning different types of the disorder. So it starts with where is that patient or child in their disease trajectory? Is this a new diagnosis where they just started developing symptoms? Um, how much has the disease progressed? So there's lots of factors. And then the nervous system is developing and changing all the time. So um, are they at a point where the nervous system is more um, stable in terms of change or is it a time of active growth and recovery um, or growth and, and um, learning new skills? So it's hard to predict. I would encourage people, if they're thinking about gene therapy, to talk to their provider on the earlier side, because as you did hear Dr. Bransoma say, time is motor neuron or time is brain. So the earlier that you intervene, typically the better that patients do. But the last thing I will mention, it also depends on whether your gene and your gene mutation are really within the mechanism of what that gene transfer product is able to do and whether your mutation matches some of the research that went into the development of that vector. So how could a family um, determine if they're a good candidate for treatment? This could be a question for either one of you or um, a good candidate for treatment or if a treatment is available to them. I'd start by saying um, it's important to have an accurate diagnosis. So, you know, you have symptoms, but make sure that you get to the right kind of specialist to know the disease that you're living with. Um, and we've had some people come through that have been labeled as having SMA their whole life, but then when we actually did the test hoping to treat them, they actually had a different disease, you know? So sometimes um, you have to question, you know, where, how you got to the point where you're at if you haven't received that precise genetic diagnosis. Um, once you have that diagnosis, get to a center that's really specialized in treating that disease because they're going to have experience with all the different options. And it's our obligation as the care team to really talk to you about every option. And gene therapy is one option, but it's not the only option. You know, there's some diseases where it may make more sense not to use the gene treatment or use a different treatment depending on where you're at in your experience of the disease. Um, and so those first conversations are really important to have with somebody who is experienced and has a care team that really is focused because I've heard some pretty sad stories from families about what they were told by the first well-intentioned people who met them after something like a newborn screening diagnosis or um, a clinical diagnosis that just weren't accurate because the person doesn't have that, you know, contemporary right now understanding of what's available and, and although well-meaning, says something that really shouldn't be said to the family about what could be done for their, um, their child. Uh, and so that is really key getting to know the right team. 
Great. Thank you. And um, Dr. Prince, you mentioned this as well. So except for a very small group, most families find out their child has SMA either through the carrier screening for parents or through newborn screening. Um, and I know you just mentioned making sure that a treatment is actually available to you, but how, how realistically, how soon could a family start treatment for gene therapy, especially with a you know, brand new baby at home? We, we've really tried to condense this as much as possible for the very urgent cases. So those babies who um, are having low copy number of their SMN2 are losing motor neurons by the day, and we really want to get it in as soon as possible. So our record is within five days, but we won't go much longer than, you know, about a month is the absolute longest in, in the less urgent situations that we've gone. I've heard it going longer in some contexts. It's again, some sometimes complicated navigating insurance and other things, but we really want to get treatment in as soon as possible once a family agrees that that's what they want to do. Awesome. Thank you. Um, anything else that either of you would share for um, a family maybe considering gene therapy? One thing you just heard is, is just how urgent it is to get medical attention, get medical attention, get second opinions, navigate the insurance barriers, all sometimes while a woman is postpartum and just even uh, all the changes that she's experiencing, especially with our younger SMA babies. But for all of our families, there's a lot that goes into a neurologic diagnosis, um, a neurodegenerative disease, and then this decision to consider um, sometimes a clinical trial, which is beyond today, or a gene therapy. So in part of the takes the village um, mantra, I would encourage people to maybe use siblings um, or our very close friends to help look into the insurance, use your HR team at work, um, you know, use resources that are available to you to get to know what your resources are. And then I will say when you're when you're considering another opinion, you know, say you have a neurologist that says, you know, I don't really do SMA. Maybe you should go see somebody else. Um, often what happens is the family then contacts the new neurologist, forgetting that they actually need to go through their pediatrician's office to get a second opinion referral. And a lot of times it's the pediatrician's office that actually needs to do this referral to a new neurologist or a new program. So really giving your pediatrician all of the data, all of the information as to why it's necessary so they have uh, the information to put together why a second opinion and stuff is needed. So you often have to become a very, um, a very strong advocate to get these services, but help use the other people in your, in your lives who are really looking for things to do to support you um, to try to get through some of these barriers. Perfect. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today and sharing your expertise with the child neurology community. Dr. Bransom, I mentioned Cure SMA is a great resource. They are fabulous. Um, and also for more resources, you can check out CNS website at childneurologyfoundation.org. If you have any additional questions um, for the Child Neurology, neurology Foundation or for our speakers, please contact programs at childneurologyfoundation.org. You can also check out our website, sign up for our newsletter um, to make sure that you hear about any new content we're creating. Thank you so much. <laughs>